No, I can give a little feedback for Mark is in here. I would just say mm -hmm. metacognition has just fascinated me for the longest time. I would know. And uh, I think a lot of, I think one of the themes from the grad school program is that this is still pretty fun, by the way, I can mark is just to remember that every student, every every person we're encountering go up in the university. It's kind of like what Plato said, like every person is facing the hidden battle. So be as kind as we can. And so I'm one of those students. I have light cognitive impairment. I have uh, challenges of loss of partners from back in the AIDS era and numerous other issues. Those are invisible things. So why would they actually matter when it comes to metacognition and learning? But they do. There's cognitive impairment, there's affective social impairment, and then there's the pluses, right? What, what those experiences actually give me. And I think that's the beauty of coming here to school. In fact, being at this school literally is the promise to my dying lover from 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we are with Medicare Strategy and Training for L2 Digital Student Leaders. Any of you hear the term digital immigrant? If we know what immigrants, right? If that's somebody who has a story. So to me, I say that's somebody who's earned their experience. When we say digital native, how many of you have seen kids just go boom, 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 on their Facebook and they just they have that thing down? That's a digital native. A digital immigrant might be somebody like us, a little bit older, who have to transition into the cognition and metacognitive skills required for learning online or communicating online. And those don't come easily. I better set a timer, guys. Or something we, we can just kind of make it happen. Here we go. This is my agenda. This is my connection about to happen a little bit more for connecting to this topic. Very brief history of metacognition and metacognitive principles. Very brief, well, actually, a lit review. And some proposed solutions for some problems that maybe aren't really showing up maybe you're kind of invisible. So I wanted to show you, this is sort of BC, right? Before Common Era. This is what I used to use pre-Google in my first time in university, way, way back when. We had this ancient thing on Noah's Ark called an art catalog. <laughs> <laughs> we would send away for the, app, for the uh, research articles that we thought were going to be really interesting. And guess what? We were lucky they showed up in a week. More likely, they probably showed up in a month, and then more likely, they probably showed up about two weeks before your paper was due. Mm -hmm. So that on the right is an interlibrary request to them. Most wonderful things. They were just magic. It's like Christmas. Okay, here's what my books might have looked like. That one on the left is that's past my pay grade. I wouldn't quite have done it that way, but I would have done it like this. And I would have been very, very careful about how I did it. The thing I didn't know that I was teaching myself back then, by the way, all metacognitive reading strategies are essentially self-taught. They can be modeled by other people, but we learn and we acquire what works for us. You know, so I couldn't use, I found out three or four or five colors. I had to use very carefully what I did use. And I couldn't write all over the books. I had to be very careful because my ADHD aspect would make that too distracting for me. But maybe it works for that learner. It's all self-created. I really love this quote that this, these two authors put together. It's an article from the New York Times talking about how you ever heard the phrase, we have that saying about uh, what's written between the margins or there's something in between the words. We don't just read between the lines, we write between the lines. And famous authors and, in, and people, students have been doing this for centuries. And we kind of think of this as sort of a lost art, but I think it can come back. So I love the second part here, highlighting and marginalia function like enzymes, breaking the book down to supply nutrition for my work. It's really nutrition for your ideas, right? It's fodder for your thinking. And you're actively dialoguing, you're contesting with the writer. You're thinking about the ideas and you're making them your own. Okay, in my undergrad time, when I went back and fulfilled that promise for my BA here, I finished in 2014, this is, this was my best friend, or somebody who sat in that desk. He, she, they sat there, they did this wonderful magic where I sat in front of them and that other monitor right there was slaved to that monitor. Why would that matter? Because metacognition is an invisible skill. Cognition and metacognition obviously are going on in here, 
But having somebody just say in a think aloud protocols, huh, I don't know the best way to find that path. Let's go to EBSCO and see if that works. Mm -hmm. Can you see it on your monitor? And then that would be what I would do. And I would watch. And then I believe I even have the opportunity to do something very similar on the secondary monitor. Well, guess what? That support structure is gone. Elvis has left the building. There is no building. It's a digital building at this point. Of course, there is a building. You kind of get my point. Okay. Later in graduate school, I got amazing opportunities through digital reading and communities of inquiry, but also hidden challenges that I think were hidden to my professors. And what do I mean by that? Well, I think community of inquiry is a really, really beautiful thing. But what if reading and metacognition isn't just a communal act, but also an extremely private act? What if in order to create in community, we first have to create in ourselves? But I didn't know how to handle the online third-party app that we had to use. Here's something that came up in this app. This is Perusal. It's a third-party LMS learning management system. And as you can probably see, this reading is askew. Well, the LMS doesn't let you highlight for things that are askew. It doesn't take kindly to pre-digitized era documentation. Added to that, there would be all sorts of commentary and all these manner of different colors, which was just a nightmare for my ADHD. It took me an entire semester to learn how to negotiate. This is Apollo Freer comment. As you can see on the left, it really didn't highlight, but I did my best to kind of show what did. That's my little icon over there, and I'm first quoting. So I'll just quote what it says here. The sum of reading involves critical perception, interpretation, and rewriting what is read. Sounds pretty metacognitive, doesn't it? You're recreating that work. But as I put here, how can I do that with a cumbersome third-party LMS, one that doesn't work well with pre-internet non-digitized text, and which does not allow me to highlight selected text in a way that looks me? Now, here's the kicker. If these are my L1 concerns in a community of inquiry with digital online reading, this is a process that took me a semester to create. Can you imagine? what it must be like for emerging L2 academic readers? And how eager would you be to say, hey, guess what, by the way, I want to be your problem child. I have an issue with the community of inquiry model. So these are the, some of the hidden struggles that I think probably happen for online spaces. Just briefly touching on the history, metacognition starts with actually a number of tributaries, but I like to point to the one in the psychology traditions. And very early on, TESOL adopted it and saw its use. And the reasons for that are really beautiful because by the time you are reading in an L2, your strategies have to be also kind of visible to yourself. And they have to be something that the teacher is helping shepherd for you. They can't give you their strategies, but they can help you find yours. Then we talk about transfer of old skill sets and the need for new ones in digital spaces. I love this image. I think you can notice why all these beautiful books, literacy traditionally understood as the ability to read and write is important in teaching language and culture because it's intimately tied to the sociocultural practices of a language use in a given society. Well, what is the given society in this image? Is that man dialoguing with books? Is it a reading circle or a Stopping and spoken out loud, or is he in a cubicle alone on his own? Maybe he is connected to a community, maybe not. We don't know. This is a sweet little idea about metacognition. I like to think of metacognition, by the way, as sort of a Swiss Army knife tool. It's available for you with a zillion different applications. It's there when you need it, but you have to know that it's there and you know how to use it. Metacognition is more than a simple reflection. It's an internal dialogue between the self as thinker and the self as learner. So Flaubert was kind of one of the greats of looking at how metacognition helps in reading and in eventually language learning. He sees it as something that comes with knowledge about, excuse me, knowledge and cognition about the cognitive phenomenon, definitely something in the wheelhouse of psychology. Oxford moves that into strategies for reading. 
the ability to relate newly acquired knowledge with old, selecting wise learning strategies, planning, monitoring, and assessing the thinking patterns. And this is a very standard model. The before, the during, and the after. How many of you looked at a book in a bookstore and thought, mm, I don't know, how many pages is it? That's actually assessing. Maybe the class is assessing. I don't know. There's all kinds of ways of assessing. We certainly do it before. We certainly do it during. And then if we're smart, we take notes and we make something about it for the, our thoughts about it after. Another way to look at it is the global, the problem solving, and the support structures for reading strategies. Global, again, would be looking at the entirety of the reading. Problem solving would be handling the individual problems as they come along. Hmm, I think I'll reread that passage. Maybe I should speak that aloud. Maybe I should uh, get a friend. That would be a support strategy. And now we come to the differences between print and digital metacognitive reading. As Singer et al. say, information seeking on the internet has become a fundamental activity in contemporary society. And as Muta says, this process has become even more complex when individuals have to do that and search in the non-native language. So there are several, or at least several, assumptions made about L2 digital academic readers. One of them, for example, is that people are importing their ability, their facility with Facebook and TikTok and all these other digital skills and say, oh, she has no problem, it's easy. Another would be to look at digital skills and understanding that these are separate from L2 learning that there is a compound effect going on if there's not sufficient tech education. So before I came here, I did city college time, and I got training in multiple applications that I needed training up on. And they really saved my keister, by the way, so it's for time here. They were vital, using it all the time. Now, for first-generation and low-income EAP digital readers, they're likely to have multiple literacy issues, or they at least have the possibility of having these. And again, these are very likely going to be invisible, not only to you as the instructors, but also to them. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Motivation, effect, and metacognition, not only are those linked, but self-regulated learning and metacognition are linked. And all of these things are not only reciprocal, they're recursive. They support each other, they spiral in more, as you accrue more and more ability, you're more and more driven to find your find what you're gonna do. And it gets, becomes more exciting, at least that's how it is right now for me, and I hope for all of you. I love this stuff, it's candy. Okay, new challenges, new growth in digital reading. So new realities are often challenging and overwhelming language for learners who juggle developing academic literacy, language learning, using multiple technologies, navigating and developing digital spaces. Yet becoming literate in these spaces is necessary for thriving in a tech-driven culture. So what are we gonna do? How are we to guide L2 academic readers towards reading systematically when the system itself has changed so fundamentally? So literacy is rapidly changing, and these additional discourses and practices are now required. And these are going to be things that they're going to need to learn in multiple areas. And many of these things may be hidden from the LQ leader, excuse me, LQ learner themselves. Why? Maybe they never had to encounter them in their L1, or maybe they're only just now getting into academic reading. Studies are mixed on the results of uh, looking at metacognition for L2 readers. And there's a number of reasons why. First off, there's been over 35 years for metacognitive reading studies in print, so there's been less than 20 for what's been looked at with digital form metacognition. Most of the studies involve self-reporting, which itself is a little bit fraught, and there are quite a bit of biases. You know, it's sort of like, you know, what I really like my skis. Why should I try that snowboard? And then eventually you do. Oh, wow. You're often running. Right? Early meta analyses kind of do this apple and orange comparison, and they're conflating ability levels, topics, and just having bad designs, in my opinion. Newer tests, just relatively new, they're emerging, um, emerging models and emerging designs seem to be incorporating schema, right? Schematic activation 
And they're first testing and saying, how do you read? How do you know what works for you when you read? Would you like some training on that? Okay, here, let's let's activate that schema, essentially what they're doing. And then they do the testing, and then they do a post-analysis on that. And those studies are showing a marked improvement in metacognitive ability for readers in digital spaces. Okay, so we have a suite of skills required, and these skills are not actively uh, taught to L2 readers. These include database searching, vetting of articles, dealing with the bottomless side of information, synthesizing across various platforms, new literacy forms of text, and managing the overwhelming community-based reading platforms. While the scholarship is undecided, we're definitely not going back. We're using right now digital forms to talk about digital forms. So we're definitely not going back. Debates about this are basically moved, therefore. And the, the main complaint of especially early uh, scholars on this topic talk about a disorienting concept about when they're when you're getting digital uh, learning. Can I ask, show of hands, how many of you got a orientation tour when you came to campus? Was it helpful? Maybe a little bit? Sometimes maybe more than one. Maybe you got a library tour as well as the mm -hmm. campus tour. How much of an orientation training are we actually giving for students in digital academic spaces? So my, I'd like to posit that that has to extend school, school wide and policy wide. It needs to be beyond pedagogy of a single classroom, and it needs to be incorporated in entire programs, campus wide. Showing this emerging scholarship shows increased efficacy of digital metacognitive reading and this strategic training for metacognition. I'm basically showing more of what I just said, except I would like to say that in this new literacies model, which by the way, what is new literacies? Well, they're usually conflated with digital literacies, but it could be looking at a video, it could be hearing an audio. I remember hearing Martin Luther King on a record at my old university. That was some of the alternate literature, alternate media offered at my school, and it blew my world. That is so much more effortless now. And those things are more and more getting incorporated in terms of what digital literacy is and means, and they should be. Also, UDL principles are also going to be a factor in how we address, I think, a lot of these solutions. So these strategies are not automatic. They can be learned with dedicated instruction and modeling, and students require active modeling. So if you're the university professor and you're over here and you're helping them with that text, you might say, huh, I don't know, what does that mean? Let me read that out loud. Does that sound right? Hmm, I don't know. Let me test that. What do you all think? And we can have a, we can have think aloud protocols that involve each other together. That's where community of inquiry really does help, in my opinion. Okay, in addition, digital environments may reveal unseen needs, as mentioned. And I'd like to just briefly mention two, two keys I've had. Sue, at 26, discovered she was something of a prodigy in language. Not only did she absolutely love, she had all manner of self-created metacognitive strategies that she was creating on the spot, on the fly, as we were learning together. She was so hungry to learn, she went on to Jefferson Adult School and took concurrent classes with hunger to get into SF State, and then went on to study Spanish before she even finished any of that. None of that would have been available under the Chinese system where she basically dropped out of high school because the competition levels are that high over there, which goes back to the point that effect and metacognition are absolutely linked. If you're feeling dispirited, you're not going to keep trying to get new ways to learn how to handle this type of technology. Hawk, on the other hand, he was 74, bless his heart, he worked so hard, and he was a great student in that he worked with the instructors, worked with the tutors, but he just didn't really quite get the technology. So without the technology and during, of course, our time during COVID, that was a major stumbling block for him, something that it, it was just a barrier. So again, I'm point, wanting to point out that I probably didn't know that that barrier existed. And actually, I kind of wondered if he had some dyslexia issues. But 
these sorts of things are going to reveal themselves. And I believe it's the onus is on the instructors to pay attention to see if these things might be occurring and to provide support scaffolding when they do, when and if they do. Also, I just want to point out that UDL concerns could be very much a barrier of access for low income and for emergent readers. And also that I've got some wonderful help from a librarian who may not be here today, but oh, bless the part. Oh, thank you so much. So somebody mentioned to me that she would print out PDF into PDF form the undergrad reading that she had to do. Maybe some of you have done that as well. For those of us who are kind of digital immigrants and we're transitioning into the digital era, that's a self-created strategy. That is a metacognitive reading strategy. And again, part of my point here is to say that the reading doesn't just begin when you have the text in hand. The reading starts with the research, with being able to log on, with technology issues, with being able to get support you need when you need it. So this is another university. This is some of their how-to uh, uh, video uh, library. More and more universities are supplying L2 language how-to videos and other uh, supporting literature uh, documents. In contrast, SF has very little to offer for digital metacognitive reading strategies, especially on the uh, the J. Paul Minter uh, website. It's very slim. I apologize for the smushed screen. This is actually three pages. This is to show how many steps beyond that first landing page are required before you get to those learning strategies that I was referring to or those how-to videos. They're quite varied. I would offer that that needs to be put as a tab at the top of the landing page of the SF library uh, of the J. Paul Leonard Library, and even having an option to have it with uh, subtitles or in the language of your choice. The dominant languages, most of all Spanish, Chinese, these need to be addressed. And why do we do that? Because studies show that even graduate level learners prefer to receive metacognitive reading first or use metacognitive strategies to first come to understanding of that <clears throat> difficult text in their original language, and then they go back to the text itself. So in the seven plus years of creating how to help videos, there's only one L2 language video available through the J. Paul Leonard Library. It was released last week. By the way, I'm just going to quickly go back here. Here I find it. Yeah, it's okay. I wanted to show, and it might be gone. There it is. We did this before in the warm up, so I know this will surprise some of you. Anybody here who wasn't in that uh, demo happen to notice how many views this video has? It's pretty small. It's 599, and that's a five year old video. So something is not meeting the need. It's not getting, it's not reaching out where it needs to. How about that phone number? Anybody try it? It's still a number that's printed on the website on the landing page. It doesn't work. It doesn't get anywhere. <laughs> what has replaced that desk? Well, at Lunar New Year, it was really cool art. Right now, there's really cool signs that say, you got this. And imperfectionism, of something of beauty, and be here now. <laughs> it's pretty hard to be here now when they're not there then. <laughs> <laughs> Here are some of my proposed solutions. As you already heard, add a dedicated tab, a how-to tab at the top of the landing page. Make these L2 videos visible. Make clear options for subtitles in the videos. Increase number and prominence of written guides. Offer an expansion of the how-to videos, a la this uh, SF State La Via Medida uh, video. There's a, there is a one dedicated group that is creating sort of entree videos for Spanish-speaking students. But that's it. And then finally, promote incorporation of digital metacognitive strategies. Incorporate these throughout campus cultures and policies. So what's in it for me? That's kind of the final question of metacognitive strategies. And why would I say that? Well, literally, this is my research. And what did I do in, on one page, right? This is 
I'll get that scholar here. It says, I remember their name. This is what I do because when I read a PDF, it's dry, it's dull. My ADHD can't really see it. So I have, as you can see, a number of self created strategies, and they are, they try to, I, I evolve them constantly, which is what metacognitive readers do, by the way. As you improve, you keep evolving your strategies. But you can see that I have the scholars name highlighted in yellow. I add potential for my own later text in all caps up there inside brackets. And if I want to have something really paid attention, I find other ways to give me a way to make sure that I'm looking at it. I think we need to find new ways to create a simulation of what we used to do with those books, with the highlighters and with marginalia. And we also need to take the time and dedicate the, to the values of helping students uh, acculturate and find their own way into metacognitive reading strategies. These aren't automatic, but they are very creative, very possibly creative. It's, it's doable. Finally, institutions, I just want to reiterate this point, absolutely must commit to helping digital readers hone their digital skills and support these digital immigrants and digital natives in acquiring metacognitive digital literacy skills. That's what Burning questions, metacognitively speaking. <laughs> cool, thank you. Yeah, I think you've all had a full plate. <laughs> <laughs>